Okay, so last lecture we started to talk about um, we started to talk about uh, methods, right? And we articulated some of the advantages we have with methods, which allows us to start encapsulating small blocks of our code so that instead of having one giant main method, we could break it down into these smaller parts. And so that's great for testability, extensibility, right? We saw how we could use that top-down stepwise refinement, which is also called decomposition of a, of a problem uh, to build out what our methods should be. So I want to continue on this track. I want to talk more about methods in uh, this lecture. I want to talk about methods as they relate to classes. I want to talk to me uh, uh, I want to talk about methods as they relate to classes and how classes relate to packages. I want to talk about API versus the method headers and how we can start using APIs to improve our ability to uh, use the Java standard library and how. In Java 2, you'll start making your own documentation, your own API documentation. In fact, in the future labs, it'll start specifying the things you need to either build or read as if it were Java API documentation. So it's a very important skill that you kind of understand how you can read what methods exist in a class, what classes exist in a package, and what all those methods do, what they all require, and what they all give back. And then I, got, I kind of want to just harp in on the static keyword because we've been using that a lot and now we finally have come to a point where we can kind of explain a little bit more about what it gives to us since we're going to start breaking start doing our own user-defined methods and our own user-defined classes that can be used by other classes in fact so a quick overview of uh this uh this uh presentation we'll do a breakdown of methods so we didn't formally do that, right? I just kind of dropped you into how we can define methods. And so that might've been very quick and rapid and you probably were able to get an inkling of what was going on, right? It's probably obvious enough with the exercises we were doing last class on what our averager, because we built an averager, didn't we? Didn't we do like a, a class averager? It's pretty clear what that method did and how the main method was able to use it, how it was able to call it to do work. But in this lecture, I really want to hammer in and be very articulate and uh, explicit with everything that goes into defining a method in Java. So really, last class was how we design using methods, and I kind of abstracted away the building blocks that go into constructing the method, and I just showed it to you. So you've had exposure to that, so you've seen it. So now I'm gonna circle back around and I actually wanna specify, this is the method header. This is the method body. These are the parts of it. The, the, this is when you have to have a return statement. This is when you don't. So really break that down today. Then I wanna compare that method breakdown to the API breakdown. So you can see there's a one-to-one -one match. So that in the future, you can go read the API documentation and see exactly how to use code that you didn't write yourself, how you can import someone else's code and easily be able to call it, because that's a very important skill if you're going to become a software developer. It's not just designing your own software, but learning how to use other people's software. And again, this metaphor of being able to take our algorithms and break it across methods and put those into classes and put those into packages allows us all to make code that can be shared with everyone else, a community of code. So, And so keep in mind when we're programming in a language like Java or any other language, whether it's Python or R or JavaScript or C++ or C Sharp or whatever, right? Whatever, Rust or Go or... These languages are all living languages. They're extensible. It means that it will be different tomorrow than it is today. And what we're using today is different than it was a year ago, that you have a community of people who are constantly contributing towards the language, making it better and making you have to do less work. Because every time someone adds something to the language, when you have a problem at hand, you don't have to know how to solve it. 
you can see if someone else had solved it and use their solution. So much about software development is not reinventing the wheel. Find out if there's a tool that does the job for you before you try to build it yourself. If there is, use it. If there's not, then you build it. And so API documentation will allow us to see what's available. Okay, so after that, we're going to take a quick gander at the java.lang package. So that's the default Java package that gets automatically, or the term we usually use in industries, implicitly uh, um, um, imported into every Java application that we write. Now, we've seen other packages that we have to explicitly or manually import. That's the java.util package. But today, I want to, since we're examining methods, we're going to examine API documentation. I really want to look at this package to make sure that everyone kind of understands what you might have available that you didn't even know you had access to up to this point. Although you haven't written a lot of codes, so it doesn't really matter that you didn't know yet. And then uh, I want to talk about how we can start then uh, methods and classes, how we can start grouping our methods. A collection of related methods into its own class and then use classes across classes. So again, one of the motivating concepts about the keyword public is that allows other classes other than the one we're currently implementing to have access to the class itself and the methods within that class. By default, we've just been using public. I want to show you why that's important. I want to show you the value of that as well. And we can we can start learning about that value with methods. And then finally, we'll talk about overloading methods, which is a interesting thing we can do in Java. Not all languages support method overloading. Um, like for instance, Python and JavaScript do not, but uh, Java, C++ do. So we'll, we'll take an examination of that at the end. Okay, so methods. So just a recap, this might be a small recap from last class methods or like many programs in and of themselves, they can have their own sets of inputs, they can have their own sets of outputs, methods talk with other methods. So inputs and outputs are a mechanism that allows one method to share data in memory data with another block of code or with another method and be able to return it back. So as effectively, the big thing that a method gives to us is that it can process a block of instructions. And sometimes we need to give that block of instructions a starting value. Sometimes it knows what the starting value is, hence the input. Sometimes we need to get back a value from our other method, and sometimes we don't, right? So we, we have those choices, four choices, right? Input yes, input no, output yes, output no, any combination of those. So software components, let's see here. So the idea though, is that we are building these tiny little programs, these little algorithms that intercommunicate with one another and they can communicate with other methods. So the motivating concept is that we can start building software components. And these software components are built off the concept of identifying our methods. Uh, and then these, these software components can then work together to build a much larger, more complicated system. So each method should have only one task, job, or responsibility, right? So if you've noticed that you're building out a block of code that's doing more than one thing, and you could do this, a good way of testing this is, can you ascribe an action verb towards what this block of code is doing? And if you, it takes more than one term for that, then that's a clue to you, hey, I need to break this into multiple methods. Another rule of thumb you could use is, is it more than a dozen lines of code. You should never, especially in industry, have a method that's more than a dozen lines of code. If it is, it's too big. Uh, and it's, I mean, you, you'll see it, but then it's poorly designed. So that's, you can do it, but that would be a poorly designed method. Okay, again, our main method is like our application manager. It's responsible for delegating tasks and ensuring programs run, and it should contain no implementation details. Remember, in our last lecture, when we designed our averager, the main method effectively made calls to the averager method. In fact, the main method looked very similar to the very first refinement from our stepwise refinement process. So again, what a well-designed main method looks like is a bird's eye view of what the algorithm is doing. 
So a well-defined method should just be a set of invoking calls to other methods, invoking calls to other methods that have really great names, such that if I read the sequence of names, it expresses almost in a human-like language what my algorithm is. And then at each one of those method names will be the block, the very particular implementations, the gritty details that actually take care of what happens there. And again, this allows me to initially see this is what's happening. And then if I need to see exactly how it happens, I can go into that method definition and see the implementation. So each method should only have, uh, yep, I already said this, method name should be precise in defining its job. Methods encapsulate instructions. Does, does the word encapsulate mean? Encapsulate essentially means hides, right? So again, one of the valuable things about encapsulation is it allows us to express a abstract or a, comp, a complex thought very concisely and, and, and very abstractly. And so we can ignore the details until we need to know it. And so that's a very valuable thing to us, especially when you start building out larger data systems where you can call a method that just has a name. I'll give you an example. You use system.out.print to be able to send any kind of in-memory data to the output stream to actually display out into the console. Do you care how that actually works? Like, do you want to read the actual implementation of what happens inside of the print method to make it work? No, like you don't care about that. That's what encapsulation gives to us. We can ignore the gritty details. We know conceptually we want to print something to the terminal. All we need to know then is the name of the method and the data we need to give it. Okay, so let's see. So methods encapsulate instructions. So uh, know what it does by, so we know what it does by its name and we don't need to know how it does it. And we only care what input it requires and what output it gives back. And again, some key terms that I want to make sure everyone's familiar with. Extensibility means you can have access uh, methods across classes. So extensibility means that we can extend the language, right? So if I make one method in one class, if I make it public, it's available in every other class. That's what it means to add extensibility into our code base. And then I already mentioned encapsulation. That means we don't need to know the details of how something works. We can just use its name and given the description, rely that it's gonna do that job. Okay, again, if we look back at the example we did last class, which was the average method, once we implement it, we don't care how it works anymore, just what it's called and what arguments it needs and what data it returns, right? So in the main method, the main method just knew I have to give a piece of text as a prompt to the averager and it's going to give me back the average. And from the main method's perspective, it doesn't care how averager works. It just cares that it's going to give it back an average. And that's, that's the mentality we want to have moving forward when we start designing software and we start relying on external classes and external methods. As long as we know what the names are and what it's supposed to give to us, we won't, we won't question it any further. Okay, so, yep, we talked about this. So a class, so here, let me give you a better uh, concept of a class though. So extensibility means we can expand the program languages with new functionality by adding more classes. A class contains or encapsulates a collection of related methods and data. So we're we should actually see that today. So we've we've been using classes just to create main methods, but I want to sh show you that we actually use it as a containing structure. We use it to group together similar sets of methods and sometimes even data. Data can go in there as well. So for instance, we'll look at the math class. The math class is part of the Java.lang package. It contains a collection of math data and methods. <laughs> beyond what we're given. So if you look at the standard set of math operators we have, they're kind of boring, right? They have addition, they have subtraction, they have division, and they have multiplication, and that's it. Now, there's a lot of more complex maths that you probably wanna be able to do, right? And without having, a, without having operators to do it, you'd have to implement that yourself. Like say, for instance, if you wanna find the cosine value of something, if you wanna find the sine value of something, right? 
if you want to find the tangent or if you want to find the max value of a number or a set of numbers or the min value or the absolute value or the square root or the, the power. These are all very common things to do numerically that we can't get from the primitive set of operators. And so until we learn how to use methods and, and classes, we have to implement that on our own. The advantage is that in java.lang, there is a math class already. So we don't have to worry about implementing square roots. We can use the math class, the math library, inside of there is a method called pow that will allow us, or uh, sqrt, I'm talking about square root this time, so square root, so sqrt, and it'll perform that duty for us. So again, the idea behind the how we select what our class name should be, should be this. I wanna do a complex mathematical operation. Where would you expect to find behaviors related to complex math? Something beyond simple operators. Well, you'd probably call those uh, math methods, right? So you create a class called math and inside that class could be all of your methods that do math-like operations. So square root is just one example of a particular numerical operation that we don't have built in, but we would like to have. But that's not the only one. Doing powers are another, right? Or doing trigon trigonometric uh, functions are another. And so all these can be individual methods that are contained inside of one class called math. And there might be values we care about, right? Like pi is not a constant value inside of Java, but it can be defined inside of a class and we can access it from the class so that if we need it, we don't have to type it out manually. So again, this is, we're gonna learn that this is gonna be one of the advantages that affords us to quickly start prototyping code much quicker, being able to rely on classes, but organizing our own code base so we can identify a group of related methods in this instance that I give you here as an example, it's the math methods, but in your own software, it could be other things. Like say, for instance, you're building a video game. Let's go back to that video game example. Uh, you might have one class that just represents all of the methods and all of the data that is assigned to the hero. So anything, so that class is responsible for mutating, for affecting and tracking the state of the hero in our game. And let's say that you have a goblin in the game. You might have a separate class that tracks just the goblin's data and the goblin's methods, what the goblin can do. So when we think of methods, think of those as verbs, actions. When you think of data, think of those as properties. Uh, we might have another class that is a dragon class that has all the properties of the dragon and the methods. So this is an idea of how we're gonna start separating our code base across classes. Does this conceptually at least make sense before we actually see any code? I just wanna make sure that the concepts are sound. Excellent. Okay, so whenever I need to find a math function, I know to look at the math class. Classes help us organize our methods and data. We can build our own classes with methods just like the math class. Uh, what we're gonna do in this lecture is build something called the max getter class that will also implement some math functions so I could show you that there's nothing magical about these classes that are predefined in Java. They are effectively the same thing you would have done by yourself, it's just they're already made. So I think it's important to understand that things that are given to you aren't any more complex than you would have done yourself. So we'll inspect that by kind of creating or rebuilding some of these math functions or math methods uh, that we're gonna experiment with uh, in just a moment. So we can build our own classes with methods, like the math class. We'll build the max getter class that also implements the math function. We'll step through the algorithm. And once we're done, we won't care anymore how it works. We just know that we can rely on it to do that job. OK, so now let's do that breakdown that I promised you. Uh, let's look at the declaration line of a method. So in Java, all our methods are declared within a class. That's not necessarily true for every programming language, but it is true for Java. So let me give you another caveat. All of our source code in Java has to go into classes in a language like, say, for instance, JavaScript or a language where in Python where we can have free-floating methods or, or, 
or blocks of code that we give name to that aren't in classes, we call those functions. So as you progress, the difference between a function and a method is that a method is defined inside of a class, a function is defined outside of a class. We will never see actual functions in Java, but if you go ahead in your future studies and start programming in C, you can very much have functions in C or assembly or some of your other classes. So it's a linguistic thing. I just want you to understand the conceptual difference between the method and function. Now, with that said, we will say that there are function methods and there are procedure methods. Function methods are a block of code that returns back a value. A procedure method is a block of code that does not return back a value. So whenever we use a void return type, we're effectively defining a procedure method. Whenever we return, whenever we have a data type that's anything but void, it means it has to have a return statement, which means it gives back some type of value, which means that's a function method. So does everyone understand kind of the difference between a function method and a procedure method? And I think we took a, I don't know if we took an example of that last lecture, but we'll certainly look at that this lecture. And of course, whenever I say block of code, that's the same thing as saying a set of instructions. That's the same thing as saying an outright, right? Those are all effectively the same concept. Okay, so again, let's continue this breakdown of a method. So methods are composed themselves of two parts. You have the method header and the method body, the method method body. There we go. So our header has four different parts to it. The first part is the access specifier. Now the access specifier can actually be made of two things. So this example doesn't show you the other part of the access specifier. So the first part is whether it's gonna be public or private. If it's a public method, then it's available to outside classes. If it's a private method, this is only available in the class that it's defined within. So it's hidden from the rest of the world. What goes in between there, between this and our return type is also whether this is a static me method or not. So far, all the methods we're gonna be looking at are gonna be static methods. But notice I can omit the keyword static and then it becomes an instance method. But instance methods don't make much sense to us until we get into uh, the tail end of this unit. So we'll pretend like those don't exist and we'll just talk about what the static keyword gives to us. And what the static keyword gives to us is that we can access this method from the class name itself without having to construct instances. Now we have very limited exposure of what it means to be an instance, but where you do have that is whenever you use the scanner class, right? When you use the scanner class, it's not like the print statement. Like when you use print statements, you're calling scanner.out.print, right? You're not having to create any variables or anything. You're able to, from the class itself, call the print command. However, in order to pull data from the input stream, we actually have to construct an instance of a scanner and tell it what it's scanning. We give it a reference to the input stream. And in your labs, you're giving scanner other things too, just to show you how awesome scanners are. Like for instance, in the labs, you're giving scanner instances to strings, right? And where you can scan a string and actually then convert that into in-memory data types like ints or floats or Boolean values, right? Have you done that already? But um, right now we'll be just using a static class. Uh, then the next part of the method declaration is going to be, what is the output? Now, every method can only return one value out. So it only ever reserve, resolves to one value. Now, that one value out could be really complex objects as we'll learn in the future. But right now, since we're predominantly just using primitive data types, that just means we can only get like a number or a piece of text or a Boolean value. So we'll call that our return type. Now, if this, if this is a procedure method, the return type would be void because we're not returning back any values. But if we do return back a value, then this would be a non-void uh, data type here. Then we would have the name of our method. In this instance, our method name is sum. Our return type is int. This is a public method, which means it's available to outside classes. 
Finally, the fourth and final part of the method header, it goes in between parentheses. And what goes in between parentheses is the collection of input data that our method requires. And in fact, what you're going to notice is those are actually variable declarations. And it's, it's separated. If it's more than one value, if it's one more than one piece of data that you need, then you can use a comma separated list. So in this example, there are two pieces of data that the some method requires. And so we will assign a data type and a label to each of those. So effectively what we're doing in the parentheses is we're declaring two local variables, local to our method, local to the block of code that is going to be in the body of our method that we will have access to. And the values of those, because notice that's just a declaration, it's not initialization, and you can't initialize these input data. The entire point of the input data is that it has to come from somewhere else in our application. So whatever other method is calling this method has to provide a value for the variable A. It's gonna have to provide a value for the variable B. And again, we're gonna see that in practice. But I'm glad you asked that. We can't declare methods. We, we can't define methods inside of other methods. And this is where it can get kind of confusing. All of our methods have to be defined inside of the class, but methods call on other methods. So like, for instance, and let's take a look at the code we did last class really quick, just so I can highlight that concept. And we'll, we'll see it again today, but since I already have that code, what was that called? Like dry averager. So let's take a look. So remember, we built this last class. And so here, if we look, I have a main method here. And if I look where my main method is defined at, it's in the class scope, right? So my class is here. And then under the main method, so this is where the main method ends because we open and close based off the set of curly braces that defines a scope. So after our main method, we can create a whole nother method. This was our method header here, right? Where this is the access type, public method. Static means we can access it from the class itself. This is, was a return type. So this method's gonna give back a value that is a data type double. The, the name of our method is get averager. We wanna be as descriptive as possible with, and notice it's like an action that we also ascribe to it. And then inside of the parameters is essentially a variable declaration that states the before our block of code, before this method can do any work, it needs to be given a starting value. And so it's defined, it's declared inside of the class, but it's actually used inside of the method. So inside the main method, this is what we call invoking, where we have the get average method name here, notice how it highlights it. Let me get the syntax highlighter. Okay, so here I'm actually calling it three times. So I've written this block of code once, but one of the advantages of methods is once I've defined it once and given it a name, I can call it an unlimited number of times. But the trick is the calls to methods have to happen in other methods. So de declaring a method has to happen in class scope but using the method has to happen within some other method. Let's go back to the example where you're putting the integer variable and you're calling it A and B in mm. the main class. Yeah. When I go to use that, I would have to use that inside of a main method. It's not method. necessary to put it there. You don't have to. Oh, what's that? You don't have to. Oh. You could end that method name at some and then initialize A and B. Well, so this is a thing though, I'm, and this is a really good question because this is going to definitely be a trip up point. The declarations that are happening, the parameters are for the scopes of the input data so that we can access them inside of our method source code. So when the main method or whatever other method goes to use it, it's not going to declare a variable, it's going to pass in an actual value. Or it'll, or it'll pass in a variable that has a value. Let's, let's look back at the dry averager. We'll look at this again with our sample code. With our dry averager, we created a declaration called uh, prompt and it's data type string, right? 
So notice that now allows us to use that variable inside of our method block. So our method block starts here and it ends here. And if you notice, we're using prompt here and we're using prompt here. Actually, I like when I highlight, you see I'm actually using it two places, on line 22 and on line 32, right? And the value, now notice I'm declaring that variable. So I have access to it. It's valid for me to dereference it to say, okay, whatever value is held at that variable, I want to use it in my prompt on 22, and I want to use it in my prompt on 32, or my, 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 my uh, printout on 32. But it doesn't have a value at this time. It's a placeholder. It's something that has to be given to us, right? Now, the value that it's given has to come from the method that calls it. So notice in here on get average, in order to call get average, since there's a un since there's an uninitialized variable, and again, all parameters, we call those parameters, the data input into a method is our parameter list. So all of our parameters start out with having no values. And in order for us to successfully invoke them, if there is a parameter inside of the method header, it has to be assigned a value so that when we try to use it in our method, it has whatever value we got from the invoking method. So here, when we call get average, the value of the string prompt will be test. But here, when we call it immediately after that, it's gonna have a new value when it's called the second time. It's gonna be homework. And then finally, when we call it this third time, the value for string prompt will be lab. So it gets called successively three different times. And for each one of those times, it'll have a different value. Does that make sense? And so what that allows us to do is declare a singular variable that can have different values for each time it's called. And then the execution of this block of code will vary slightly differently depending on what that value is. And in this instance, it changes the wording of the prompt on whether we're looking for test grades, whether we're looking for lab grades, or whether we're looking for homework grades. And maybe this will make more sense with the, uh, a simpler example, but does it? Yeah. Well, yeah, like, um, um, yeah. So if I had to do an example of cooking, for instance, uh, I might have a recipe that tells me that I have to add a protein to my dish. And then that gives me the option when I actually implement that recipe, whether I want to select fish or chicken or beef. So like the very, the parameter that I'm given in order to successfully execute the food recipe is that I have to add a protein. But then when I'm actually implementing, when I'm actually calling upon the recipe to actually execute it, at the time of calling it is when I get to decide what value that protein has, whether it's a fish protein or whether it's a beef or a pork or what have you. And it could be based off of dietary constraints, right? Like if the meal has to be kosher, I would use a non-pork protein. If it had to be um, uh, uh, vegetarian, I might use like a bean or tofu protein. So I can have additional constraints that might decide what, what is the value of this parameter gonna be. But the recipe doesn't really have to change otherwise. Does that help make it more sense? Okay, with that said, we're actually at a point where we can do a quick little demo. Okay, so... Uh, let me go ahead and make this and then we'll we'll run through this a little bit. So I would it be helpful if I give you these ugly slides? I mean, these slides are awful, but they'll be helpful. Okay. I'll go ahead and I'll post those in the, the Moodle then. But they're super embarrassing slides right now. Okay, what did I call this? Um method demo. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new Java file. I'm going to call it method demo because the entire point of this class is to demo methods. 
Okay, now I'm going to take away source code initially, and we will slowly implement this out as we as we need to. I don't want to do too many methods at once. So I'm going to take this one out, and I'll take this out. Okay, so let's start with these first two methods. So here I'm going to do a main method because recall that the starting point the launching point of every Java application is the main method. If we don't have the main method, we can't execute that class. So we'll have a main method. Now, the entire point of this is to show you that I can have other methods that we do define. And one of the prior slides, I said there were two forms of methods. We had method procedures and method functions. Method procedures don't return back a value. So at the return type, which will be this kind of, this portion right here inside of my method header, I would use the word void that articulates, hey, I don't return back any data. Now, so inside of here, I'll put an instruction. So whenever I actually implement my body, the body, just like with everything else in Java, starts with a curly brace and ends with a curly brace. So we open and close scope. Inside the curly braces can go blocks of instruction. So again, this is exactly like the main method, but with a different name. Uh, we'll print out in here, no value returned. And then I will explicitly give a return statement. But when I have a void data type, if it's not actually returning the value, it's not necessary. So I can return nothing. Notice I'm not putting a value after it. So I'm returning nothing. So what I'm returning is control of the uh, application, control of being able to execute instructions to whatever called me to do work. So effectively what return says is I'm done. And if I don't give it a value, it, you can take back over. So when we invoke a method, what we, what we do here, so inside of main, when main calls, I can invoke method procedure here. So this is an invocation versus a declaration. Declaration happens at the class level where I can then define the block of instructions that define what this method does. So this just prints out and then it returns back control to the main method. So when I go to invoke this, what's happening on line three is I then jump and execute. Now this doesn't require any parameters in, right? There's no data in there. So I can just start executing right away. So I'm going to print out the statement. And since this has no return type, I can just return control when I'm done, the block of instructions right back to the main method from where I left off. So, and then here is an example of a method function. Remember a method function is a method that does return back a value. So if, it does return back a value at the return type. We use a non void data type. It could be int, it could be string, it could be Boolean, it could be car, it could be byte, it could be anything. It could be a uh, scanner, right? So it could even be complex objects. And then the trick though is if you define a return type, then you have to have a return statement as the very last line. It has to be the last line because what the return does is a, it returns control to whatever called this method to do work. The return is like saying, I'm done running this block of instructions. It's your turn, pick back up. Now in this instance, I can put a value after the return and it will give back to that method, whatever is that value. And whatever data you put after the return has to be the same data type that you declared in the method header. So for instance, here, I said that this returns back a string. So the value that I return back in the return statement better be a string. Otherwise, I'm going to get an error. So again, for method functions, we have to have return statements. For method procedures, we don't. That's optional. And I'll prove that. So let's go to Java. Let's let's. Okay, so here I run the code. I guess I can make it bigger. There we go. So here I run that. 
And notice it, it executes those methods in order. So here I have no value returned that was printed inside of the block of code for that method for method procedure. And then for method function, we're getting returns back this string. Well, this string was given to the main method here, right? So we invoked method function and notice we can actually have that method invocation on the right-hand side of an assignment operator. So remember the rules for an assignment operation is that on the left-hand side, it has to be a variable. And on the right-hand side, it has to resolve into a value. Well, since we claim that this will return back a string, then I can know that if I call this method, it's gonna give me back a value of a string. And when it does give me back that value of a string, I can save it into memory under the label response and then use it later, such as on line five to actually print it out. And that's what actually happens here. So this is an example of a method that doesn't return back a value and one that does. And I said that this was optional, so I'll prove it. I'm gonna comment that out. I'm not gonna do more than comment that out. I'm gonna delete it. I'll delete that. So now my method procedure does not have a return, but because it's void, it will implicitly add that for me. And that's mostly how you're going to see uh, uh, most methods that are method procedures is it will not have the return on there. And notice it still returns control. But since we're not returning any value, it doesn't really matter. So when it ends, Java automatically gives back control as if we had that return word added at the end. But no, effectively, they both have returns. So we, that's one frustrating thing I see in the book. One, one of the things that I see a lot with uh, junior developers is that they'll sometimes forget the return keyword because you start a lot of times playing around with the void methods that just do some processing and they, they implicitly return control back to the invoking function and you don't get in the habit of seeing that return. And then once you start playing around with method functions where you do have to return back values, you put the data type, but then you forget to put the last return statement. So I think it's valuable to say the return statement actually goes on every method. It's just, if it's a void, we can omit it because Java adds it for us. Is there any questions with this? Uh, okay, so I wanna show you one more thing with this demo that I omitted out last time. So I'll, I'll do a little bit of cut and paste back here. So I'm gonna make one more method because this shows you how we can have a method that doesn't return back a value and where we have a method that does return back a value. Finally, I want to show you that we can make a method that takes in values. Like we already saw that last uh, with the other demo, dry average here, but this is a little simpler, I think. And it takes more than one value. So here, recall inside the parentheses, we can declare all of the initial state of data that this block, that this method's going to require in order to do its work. So here, let's say it requires a numerical piece of data called int. And let's say that it has a text piece of data that's called string. I'm, I'm sorry, a string piece of data that's called text and a, a, uh, an integer data type that is a number. Then I'm going to print it out. And the notice, since these are declarations, these don't have values, it's gonna to require to get these values from the thing, from the method that decides to make use, to call upon this method. So in our main method, our main method is gonna call method inputs here. And so when it calls it, it has to give it as many values as it has variables declared in its parameter list. And remember, variables are declared with a data type and a name. So the first data type is an integer and the name is number. The second data type is a string and the name is text. So I'm going to put in the order that it's declared. So this value of 9999, 9999, so will then be given to the value that, that will define the variable number. And then this second parameter here, hello from main, that string literal will be saved into the text variable. Does that much make sense? Yeah, it does. That's the question, I guess, for you is there to do it in order? Is that just because? No, if I flip flop yeah. it, 
Yeah, in fact, I'll prove that. First, let me do it with it working and then I'll break it. So let's, so what is this? This is method demo. Okay, so. Okay, so that's it working, right? So it's printing what we expect. The values that we pass into the, the method from our main method. Now, what if, what if I reverse that? Well, Java's not smart, right? Like these are computers. So it, it, what it's gonna do is it's gonna map the data type. And if I do this, even though it's the same number of parameters and the same data type, since it's out of order, it's gonna try to save hello from Java to an int variable, right? It's gonna to try to save the value to the variable in the order that they're defined. So it's gonna give me, if I try to, um, if I save that and if I try to compile that, it's gonna give me an error. It's gonna say, hey, that's an incompatible type. I, let's read through the error though. A string cannot be converted into an int data type. So one of the nice things about Java is when you learn how to read these errors, it makes it very easy to see what I did wrong inside of my code. And also, it's not just that, I need both those parameters. So if I just try to put in 999, but I omit the second parameter, watch what happens. It's gonna say, hey, the method, method inputs in our class, method demo, cannot be applied to given types. It shows me this invocation is wrong. Why? It requires an int and a string. So it even shows me what it expects. And then it shows me what I gave it, but I gave it just an int. So we, so we, this, is a, this is a really important rule. Whenever we have these methods, we have to, and they require input, then we have to give it that input in the same order and the same like magnitude and the same quantity in the same count that it expects. But so long as we do that, then it will do its job, execute its instructions, and then it's gonna either return back control or return back a value to us. Right, so does anyone have any other questions related to this? Does this make sense? Okay, so now that we've talked about methods, and I think we've seen methods in a way that it's understandable, at least at a very kind of basic level. The next thing I wanna do is now bridge what we've been doing with methods into the documentation so that you could start becoming better at reading how other methods work, because that's gonna be an invaluable skill to build out your capabilities as a Java or any kind of developer, right? All, all code bases use documentation, uses APIs. And in fact, uh, let's talk about what an API stands for. You've probably heard the term. It stands for Application Programming Interface. But effectively, it's just, it's just the instruction manual for what you can do inside of your code. So the API is the documentation devel developers use to quickly learn what packages, classes, and methods do. Packages contain classes, classes contain methods. The smallest unit of code in Java is a method. So notice we've been implementing the actual instructions and methods, the methods get grouped into classes, and then classes get grouped into a folder, that folder is called a package. So in API documentation, each row that we read is going to give us information about a method within a class. Here's an example method from an API documentation which matches to the method header. So again, let's think about the, the, the way the ordering that our method header had and then look at the way it's given to us in the API. So we have the modifier and type. So we're told this is the, the modifier here is static. Now remember the modifier in our header is public static, right? Both of those make up the modifier. Public is something we can see outside of our class. Private is something we can only see inside of our class. So here I put a note, only public methods are listed in API documentation. Then I asked the question why, because I think that 
this should be, it's obvious to me, I want to see how obvious it is though, to someone who hasn't been developing for a long time. Why do you think only public methods are listed in the API documentation? Exactly, because it doesn't matter if it's private, because you don't have access to it. The entire point of the documentation is this is what you can do with this class, but you're doing it from outside of the class. So you can have a thousand private methods and 12 public methods, and the only ones you should see are the 12 public ones, because you don't care about the private ones. You don't have access to them. So yeah, very good, very good answer. So you're not, that's not gonna be listed. It's assumed that every method inside of the API by default will be public so that we have access to it. Now, the second is whether it's static or not, just know that most of the methods we're gonna be looking at right now are static methods. And so that means it's off of the property. It's, it's, it's available from the, the class level which means that I would use the class name and then the method name to access it. I'll show you a demo of that. Uh, if not this lecture, the next lecture. Uh, then it shows us our return type. This is gonna give back a double. Then it shows us the method signature. So a method signature is a combination of two things. It's the method name and the set of inputs it takes. So notice this method has the name ABS, short for absolute value, and the data type that we can pass into it is a double data type, right? And then the last thing I have is the description, the human language explanation for what this method does. Here it says it returns the absolute value of a double value. So, that, so does everyone kind of see the one-to-one -one matching that a method header to the API documentation has? Yes, no? Okay, let me just make sure I hit all these points. So yeah, uh, static modifier accessible from class level access, return type is our output. The method signature is a combination of the name and the data inputs. The description is an explanation for what the method does. And so note the method header equals the API doc. Okay, let's take a look at some actual API. So. One of the nice things about Java's APIs is actually all of Java's APIs are produced using a tool called Java Docs. You will learn how to use Java Docs to produce your own API in the next class in, in 2120. But the nice thing about Oracle actually giving a uniform tool for auto-documenting code means that all of the documentation is the same. That means it makes it very easy on you, right? You don't, have, you don't have to read other people's standards. You can have an expectation that once you know how to read the standard Java API, you can read any other API for the Java language. So let's take a look at this. Um, actually, how would we normally find this? Let's say I want to find the Java package. It was java.util. And I want to do Java. I want to do the most version, uh, up to date version Java, which as of this recording is Java 18. So I'll just Google that. The first hit that I get is from Oracle, it's from their documentations uh, uh, portion. And it's going to give me the package. So this is the package level. So I said a package is a collection of classes, or it could be actually even a collection of other packages. So a package can hold other packages which hold classes. So again, when I say package in Java, you want to think of a folder directory in your OS. So you can have nested folders, you can have nested packages. I want to go to, um, okay, so here, if I went to the API, this is the collection of related packages. So these are base packages. These, these aren't part of java.lang. Um, these are part of java.base. So it just gives you supporting packages you might care about. I'm going to ignore that. Then I'm going to come here. This is going to then give me the list of all the classes that are contained in this package. So a class is a very particular Java file. So we should know that because we've been building Java classes, right? So every time we've made like main.java or myclass.java or like homework1.java or zombieapocalypse.java, that's creating a class file. The class files are contained inside of the package. So here, each one of these are essentially a .java file. 
Now, let's take a look at, say, for instance, the math file. So the, the other thing I want to illustrate is this package we're looking at, the java.lang package, is the one that is always imported into your code by default. You don't have to explicitly do it like the java.util package. So all these classes you see, you automatically get in every Java application. So the moment you create a class file, you get all of this. Now, we're not going to obviously look at the entirety of this package. I'm going to pick and choose some things that are interesting, that are worth your time to, uh, to learn early on. But the more you evolve as a Java developer, the better you get, the more you'll read this documentation, the more of these classes you'll slowly start to learn. Right, so it's just like building up any other kind of language. You start with smaller sets of words and and verbs, and so you can start building your basic statements and paragraphs and small stories. And the more complex you get with it, the more you can enrich your language use of it. So, I know this. My my point is saying this looks complex, but it's because Java is used to write applications that are millions upon millions of lines and having a rich set of tooling is better as you want to do more tasks. So this is like your dictionary of what you can do in Java. But what I wanna show off is uh, the math. So let's do the math class. I guess I can find it here, but I'll, sometimes Google is just much quicker. I, identifying things. So we'll see inside of java.lang right here, I have the class math. And here I can even see it's inside of the module java.base. So if I want to navigate that from the API, I would have had to know to go java.base to get there. Okay, so when we look at an API, there are two major categories that will be defined for us. We will have fields, Fields is another term for variable. So fields are data, pieces of data, data values. So I have two fields. They're both, and we can read this, right? This is the modifier and type. So it's static. Final means that, that it is read only. It means you can't write over it. So it's a variable that you can only read. You can't write, write on it. Another word for that is called a constant. So it has two constant values that are di uh, double data type, E, the value of E, and pi, the value of pi. And I get the descriptions there. So notice I can see I have two data fields there, and then I have a lot of methods. And so again, we learned how to read this already. All of these methods in the math class are of the static type, right? It's the same type, the same modifier type that we've been using for our own purposes. That means all of these methods are available from the class level. So we can call on the math class, we can do math dot, dot is a special operator in Java that allows us to access something from within it. So again, when we did uh, system dot out, there was an output stream inside of a system class. And then when we did system dot out dot print, there was a print method inside of an output stream inside of a system class. So we understand that the thing on the right-hand side of the dot is inside of the thing on the left-hand side of the dot. Okay, so static means that we can call the methods directly from the class name. Then we have our return types. Then we have our method signature, which is a combination of the method name and its input fields. The reason why we use method signatures is because unlike variables where you can only have one variable that has a unique name in the same scope, in method, you can have multiple methods that have the same name so long as the parameter list is different because what makes the signature, so a variable signature is just its name. A method signature is the name and its collection of inputs. Combined, that creates a unique expression for that method. And that's why when we call methods, even if they don't have inputs from our code base, we always have to use the brackets because that's like saying no inputs. And that helps distinguish it whether it does have uh, inputs or not. It's part of the invocation on it. 
Excellent. We'll cover more. We'll pick back up with this math class and actually do examples of that next lecture. Before I, I uh, let everyone go, is there any questions from where we're at right now that would behoove us to have inside this report? Okay, if there's no questions, continue on doing the test and we will finish up our talk of methods uh, on Thursday.